welcome to Big Blend Radio, where we celebrate variety and how it adds spice to quality of life. I remember when I was a little girl, I don't even remember how young, but really young, Nancy took me to a restaurant and she ordered coffee like most grown-ups did it that morning. But she allowed me to have hot chocolate. And I remember going, ooh, hot chocolate. And not only was I allowed to have hot chocolate in a adult cup, like an actual cup, right? So I think I was really young at this point, but this was a big outing for me. And I was allowed to have marshmallows and a little bit of chocolate sprinkled on top. I felt like the most adult little girl on the planet and special Some people will go into, oh, that's a princess moment, but this was special. I felt like I had stepped into some kind of adulthood special little girl place where I was still not an adult, but something magical just occurred in my life. Well, that magic is hot chocolate. And I sat like a young lady and she made me sit upright in that restaurant, sit up, behave, not play around. I think it was probably my first um, outing as, you know, as a young girl in a restaurant where you will behave. But it was magical. It was absolutely magical. And those marshmallows, it's better than the whipped cream. I think there was a little bit on there too, but I remember the marshmallows more than anything. And anytime I look at a marshmallow, I think of hot chocolate. So welcome today, today, today to today's Big Daily Blend show. Uh, You know, today we're going to talk about hot chocolate because it is National Hot Chocolate Day, January 31st. So who doesn't love a hot cup of hot chocolate or a hot cup of cocoa? We're going to get into that. But today is not just about hot chocolate. It's also about the late and great Carol Channing. Our friend Steve Schneikert has a wonderful Hollywood history podcast he did five years ago uh, when she passed. He does one of the best impressions uh, that anyone can do of Carol Channing. Carol Channing passed and on January 15th, 2019. This year marks five years of her passing. I can't believe it. Uh, It's been a while, right? You would think, but all so close. Uh, We get so close to these wonderful humans that make us laugh, make us smile, make us feel comfortable, and make us feel not alone in the world when things get wonky. That's what comedy is about. And she was a very real personality. Uh, She was born January 31st, today, on this date, in history, her birth anniversary, I should say, January 31st, 1923. So think about it. Uh, She's 101 really, if she was still here, but she's still here in our spirit. So that's what we're doing today. We're going to be talking about hot chocolate and Carol Channing. Do they have similarities? I was thinking about this. And now Steve may get mad at me and say, you didn't do a good job, but I think he'll give me a grace period on this. He knows Carol Channing and her work like Hello, Dolly, better than I could ever know. And we're going to air his Hollywood history segment at the end of this. And this is not going to take long, but I do hope we all have some form of hot chocolate today if you like it. You know, it was an elixir for the Mayans and one of the best drinking chocolates. And it's a little different than hot chocolate, right? It's a little bit powerful. And I had that in Santa Fe. Uh, I think it's Kakawa was the shop. And it was this little cup, teeny little cup, hot a little thicker than we have in American terms. And boy, did I want to run around. I felt all pumped up. And you think about it, for soldiers, that was a big deal. So I was thinking and looking up history about this because it got me all like revved up. And I'm like, well, I know the Mayans like got revved up and things. But now what I did learn is that hot chocolate was actually used to keep soldiers up and ready and awake in World War I um, at the YMCA back in the day, not just the song. Um, over 25,000 volunteers set up comfort stations all along the battlefront, and they were stocked with magazines, cigarettes, and snacks. 
and cocoa. And I think this is also kind of when we got into World War II, we got into donuts, but that's going to be another podcast. Uh, so World War I, hot chocolate and cocoa, cocoa, we're going to get into the difference in a little bit, were a big deal. So that's a little activism that our cocoa did, our hot chocolate. Well, when I look into the history of Carol Channing, she was also an activist. She was an activist for AIDS awareness. And also, um, she talked a lot about the chorus men from the original Dolly show died at a young age from AIDS. She was a supporter of the Actors Fund. And in her autobiography, Just Lucky, I guess, she talked about her parents um, and even her paternal grandmother, uh, that her grandmother was black and she kept it quiet. And it took a long time, over 50 years for her to come out and say, hello, Dolly, literally. And um, I'm thinking now we're about to head into Black History Month. And I think it's great that she did speak out. And, you know, it was a big hush hush thing at the time. When you think back, Sammy J. Davis Jr., um, you know, all the musicians and artists and dancers and actors, what they went through to actually be seen. You could be seen, but not heard. Uh, she finally was able to do it and she did do it. So she was an activist. And so was our hot chocolate keeping soldiers awake and active. Let's talk a little bit about comfort. I was talking about this just special moment with my mom and I and this joy that hot chocolate brings us. We often think about it over Christmas. Thanksgiving kind of sets in, maybe more cider then. But then Christmas, it's that hot cocoa. But I'm telling you, depending on where you are right now, today um, we're in Oregon and there's still snow outside and a hot cup of cocoa, a hot cup of chocolate, uh, hot chocolate, I should say hot chocolate, um, would be great. You can add a little splash of rum. Some people do that in different cultures. Um, and every culture does it differently. But it's about comfort and how it makes you feel good. And I think that is part of what Carol Channing did too. She made people comfortable. She went on shows that made people laugh and be comfortable. And so did hot chocolate or cocoa. Even we used to have hot chocolate houses, especially in the 17th century England. Um, there were actual chocolate houses. And one dates back to one is called White's. And it was established as a chocolate house in 1693. And they served hot chocolate in pitchers made out of gold and porcelain and silver. And I mean, it was a big deal, just like you'd go to a tea house or a coffee house. Hot chocolate was that big of a deal. Now, we just, you know, put a little Swiss Miss in, had some hot water. It's not the same. I know Miss Swiss Miss is good, but like, honestly, when you have a really good drinking chocolate, it's, it makes you comfortable. It warms your insides. It keeps you alert and awake. And that's, I think, is what comedy does. It comforts and keeps you awake and your brain thinking at the same time. And it also goes to laughter. That's my next point of what Carol uh, Channing did. And she used to go on the Carol Burnett show too, which was cool. Um, laughter. She was a huge personality and made people laugh. She was honest. Um, she's just an honest person in what she did. And laughter, as we all know, is medicine. And hot chocolate is actually a medicine uh, from the 16th to 19th centuries. Uh, people used cho hot chocolate for fever, uh, for stomach ailments, for liver disease, Chocolate has been, I mean, like we were saying, even keeping awake and alert. So hot chocolate uh, is medicine. Laughter is medicine. So that's where I'm going on that too. Uh, and in fact, Carol Channing even has this famous quote, laughter is much more important than applause. Applause is almost a duty. Laughter is a reward. Moving on, spice. This is a thing I think Carol Channing really had. Um, she could do many roles. And um, we're going to talk about two main roles, um, which, you know, we're going to talk about with hot chocolate and hot cocoa, two roles. Um, but she had spice. She had a spice. She was feisty. She had grit. She had humor. 
and at the same time, that comfort level where we're talking about. So spice, that's a thing that when you were talking about the Mayans, that was, you know, they were drinking hot chocolate way back in 500 BC. And they were actually making it into this thick foam. They were whipping it up with cocoa seeds, uh, cornmeal even, water, chili peppers. So we got that spice. And then eventually Cortez, the explorer, went to Europe and said, hey, y'all, look what I've got. He didn't say it that way. Um, But they started doing it as a cold thing. And then royalty got a hold of it. And then Spain said, no, we want it hot and sweetened. And they kind of made this thicker beverage. And um, they actually eat it with, uh, drink it with churros. Um, But some cultures, they put spice. Everybody does something a little different. So it shows versatility. And spice uh, brings a variety to quality of life, as we say here on Big Blend. Uh, A little bit of something different is great. And we love that. Uh, That's why we are Big Blend. And I think Carol Channing had that as an actor and a comedian. But um, they say two roles. Let's look at this. Hot cocoa or hot chocolate. So... um, when we talk about hot chocolate, there's a little bit difference. Uh, hot cocoa is got, you know, cocoa is taking the cocoa butter and from the cacao beans. Hot chocolate is made directly from a bar of chocolate. So it's already got the cocoa. And basically, um, you're going to put in the sugar and the cocoa butter. And this is a melted, beautiful, just yummy, thicker kind of consistency and I would like some right now. And I do want the marshmallows. Oh, please give me the marshmallows. Um, but don't put them on the the pie, the pumpkin pie. Why are we doing that? Uh, a lot of you love it. So I'm not going against it. I'm just saying. But um, cocoa is really just, here it is. We're going to give you, you know, Swiss Miss with a little teaspoon. And you can put milk, you can put water. But it's our, all the extractions and all the process is done. But I do like the idea of hot chocolate, like melting a chocolate bar. That to me is like magic. And you can add water, but um, there's something about chocolate actually being melted that just feels like, ooh, this is going to be really, really good. So when we look at two roles, they say about Carol Channing that she was really well known for being Lorelai Lee in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And also, of course, Dolly Gallagher, Levi, uh, Levi uh oh, Dolly Gallagher, and Hello Dolly. And so that was her main two roles. But again, she was still amazingly versatile, more than I think she was given credit for. So we want to say happy birth anniversary to Carol Channing and um, hello, hot chocolate. Let's have some. I think that sounds delicious. We do have uh, a link for a recipe to make. Um, hot drinking or European drinking chocolate. And this is a recipe that is from the book Making Chocolate. We first published it when the book came out in 2017, which is by Dandelion Chocolate, which is a bean to bar chocolate factory that was founded in 2010 by Todd Masonis and Cameron Ring. So this will give you four, uh, excuse me, five four ounce servings. And um, it's profile. They give you a chocolate profile of this drink. Chocolatey, nutty, rich fudge brownie. Okay, I'm in. And um, they, they, they add warm milk and brown sugar to it. It's apparently really good, but it was also developed by their first pastry chef, Phil Ogilia. Uh, Ogila, excuse me, you know, I can't pronounce anything, right? Um, and it, they say it tastes like a pure melted chocolate bar and it's one of their most popular drinks to date. It's a rich sipping chocolate across between the strong water-based hot chocolate in Paris and the most almost thick as pudding Italian kind. And um, I'm thinking I'd like to make this recipe today. So check it out. Uh, The link is in the show notes for this European drinking chocolate. I hope you enjoy Steve Schneikert's Hollywood History uh, episode. It's only a few minutes, uh, but it is a wonderful tribute in honor of Carol Channing's life. Thank you all for joining us here on the Big Daily Blend podcast here on Big Blend Radio. When a man with a chimney 
Jim Chong. Meet a girl with a different air. Why should the tortured creatures beat around the bush when heaven knows Mother Nature always needs a little push? So I put my hand in here. I put my hand in there. With her husky voice, one of the most easily recognized and most imitated in the world, gigantic saucer eyes, poofy platinum bob, and an ear-to-ear -ear pearly white smile. Carol Channing was a larger-than-life luminary. Fans could not resist her. In Hello, Dolly, which opened at the St. James Theater on Broadway in January 1964 and ran through December 1970, Channing crackled as meddling matchmaker Dolly Gallagher-Levi. Featuring a score by Jerry Herman and book by Michael Stewart and based on Thornton Wilder's 1954 stage play, The Matchmaker, Hello, Dolly!, produced by David Merrick, won 10 Tony Awards, including one for Best Musical and another for Channing as Best Actress in a Musical. Carol Elaine Channing was born in Seattle, Washington on 31 January 1921 the only child of Adelaide and George Christian Channing. A city editor at the Seattle Star, George Channing took a job in San Francisco, and the family moved when Carol was two weeks old. She attended Aptos Junior High School and Lowell High School in San Francisco. When she was 16, she left home to attend Bennington College in Vermont. Carol was introduced to the stage while helping her mother deliver newspapers to the backstage of the theaters while growing up in the Bay Area. Her first job on stage in New York City was in Mark Blitzstein's No for an Answer. She was 19 years old. Channing moved to Broadway for Let's Face It, in which she was understudy for Eve Arden. Five years later, Channing had a feature role in Lendon Ear for which she received her Theatre World Award and launched her as a star performer. Channing credited illustrator Al Hirschfeld for helping make her a star when he put her image in his widely published illustrations. She said that a drawing of her as a flapper was what helped her get the lead in her next play, the Julie Stein and Anita Luce musical, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. From that role is Laura Lee, Lorelei Lee, I should say, she gained recognition with her signature song from the production. A kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. Finding roles that suit the strange and wonderful charms of Carol Channing has always been a problem to Broadway showmen. She looks like an overgrown cupie. Her speaking and singing voice is definitely unique. Her dancing is crazily comic, and behind her saucer eyes is a kind of gentle sweetness that pleads for affection. During Channing's illustrious, iconic, and legendary Broadway career, she has received four Tony Award nominations, winning once. She was the recipient of a special Tony Award in 1969, inducted into the American Theatre Hall of Fame in 1981, and was given another Tony Award for life achievement in 1995. Her words, For my lifetime, I can't think of anything more soul-fulfilling than I could have done. It was the only thing to do. In film, Carol Channing won a Golden Globe and was nominated for a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for playing eccentric widow Muzzy Van Hosnier in the musical Thoroughly Modern Millie. Raspberry! In television, she won an Emmy Award for the 1966 special An Evening with Carol Channing. Before the parade passes by, I've got to go and taste Saturday's high life. Before the parade passes by, I've got to get some 
life back into my life. Well, Carol has gone to that fancy new address in the great white way in the sky. Something tells me she'll keep putting her hand in. I'm Steve Schneikert, and this is Hollywood Broadway history as I recall it. Radio. Keep up with our shows at BigBlendRadio.com.